There are few places where black masculine youth can go to express a range of emotion without negative social consequences. Consequences including being shamed if they cry, being seen as a threat if they show the slightest bit of anger, having their masculinity called into question if they're tender or emotional. Where can black masculine youth go to be fully human? Where can they cry? Where can they be angry and expressive in that anger? Where can they embody full bravado, rage even? Where can they go to be affectionate with other masculine people? Where is a place they can go where they don't have to shrink their bodies or their voices to be heard? I think one of those places is the basketball court. When I was a kid, the basketball court was the place I went to express my masculinity. It was the one place where I could go where I didn't have to be a girl. I didn't have to be nice or pretty. I could be rough and aggressive. I'm curious, how might the basketball court serve as a site of emotional exploration in black masculine youth? And I wonder, what can they discover about themselves when given the safety of the basketball court? And perhaps a deeper question, what gender norms are bendable, breakable even, on the court? A year ago, I got the opportunity to conceptualize a three-part exhibition about black masculine youth and safe spaces to express emotion. And I knew one of those exhibits needed to be about the basketball court, because I know how much basketball means to black masculine youth and black culture. My experiences as an educator have taught me that before you ask someone to consider something different, you have to affirm them for who they already are. And so I wanted to celebrate and evoke the spirit of the basketball court and just trust that it can hold whatever conflict that might have come up. With the help of so, so, so many people, I was able to transform an industrial space into an immersive and experiential art installation called All on the Court. The installation featured 400 pairs of basketball shoes, a life-size half court with a video projected onto the floor, and video projections of testimonials of basketball players onto a wall. What I want to share with you today is the process of collecting the stories and the shoes and my observations of other people's experiences engaging with the work. First, let's talk about these shoes. I put a post on social media asking people to donate to my, my project. And in just three weeks, people all over the country sent me shoes. Now, I didn't have much expectations about the quality of shoes. I actually really thought that people would just, you know, give me things that they didn't want anymore or shoes that were headed for the trash. My dad calls those dustbusters. <laughs> when people learned about what the project was about, they sent me their treasures. I got a DM from a woman. She was actually a stranger. See, she messaged me and told me that she played for Kansas State and that she'd been holding on to these shoes for 15 years. You can see the, the sole has fallen off. But she told me that she wanted to give her shoes to this project. And so to honor her, we created a QR code that linked to her stats. And when I Googled her, they were really impressive. She was a really great basketball player. And a quick aside, I created QR codes for most of the basketball shoes that took you to more information about the player who played them or a history about the shoe. 
I got some really good shoes. <laughs> Eventually, I got shoes that spanned every decade of basketball. I got Converse, of course. I got Clyde Drexler Pumas. I got Emmett Smith. I didn't know he even made a basketball shoe. Jordans, of course. And one that made me smile, the classic Reebok pump, the Kimikazes, <laughs> right? <laughs> to highlight the significance of every basketball shoe that was featured in an exhibit, I collected stories from some of the players who wore them. This is my nephew, Xavion. This is Lonnie Harrell. If you Google him, he's a DC legend and a basketball legend. This is a person I met while looking for people to highlight in the exhibit. She said that basketball saved her and kept her out of trouble. This is also my nephew. <laughs> you can see that we projected their video testimonials onto the wall right beneath the shoes that they wore. This is my friend Twig. We went to college together. He played for our alma mater and was one of the best basketball players in the state of Arkansas. Then he got hurt. I told him about the project, and you can see he's a sneakerhead. And the shoes that he's holding are a pair of Kobe Bryant's Crazy Eights. Kobe Bryant is his idol. And these were the only pair of basketball shoes that he played in his entire adult life. And I told him, I was like, you do not have to give me these shoes because I know how much they mean to you. And with tears in his eyes, he said that this is for a good cause and that he was willing to let them go. This is Malachi holding a basketball. He's one of my former students. He helped me by organizing the pickup basketball game that we filmed for this installation. Some of my other former students are also featured in the film. It features their stories and also narration by my father-in-law, Cliff Wright, who was a Harlem native and played pickup basketball in the legendary Rucker Park in the 1960s. I crowd, well, I used social media to crowdfund a stipend to play the players and to cover the cost of a bus because I wanted people who didn't have access to transportation, like many young people, the young people I teach, I wanted them to be able to come to the show. And the community really, really showed up. I asked for money, and in two hours, fully funded. Like, people just sent me money. It was coming, like, every, every minute. So I'm really grateful to the community that helped me. On average, people spend about 17 seconds with the work of art. And so I really didn't have much expectation outside of that for visitors who attended the show. But not only did people spend well beyond the 17 seconds, they came back with their friends. I remember escorting a man who's in the suit right next to me, escorting him into my exhibit. I just met him and we were laughing, we were talking, but then when he got to the pillar of shoes, he burst into tears and collapsed into my arms. To give you a picture of what that looked like, imagine me holding and consoling the rock. <laughs> <laughs> he told me that his mother couldn't afford to buy him a, a pair of basketball shoes when he was younger, and that he spotted the first pair of shoes he purchased with his own money. Meanwhile, on the basketball court, somehow, in some way, a group of kids found a basketball and was playing a game of 21 in my art exhibition. <laughs> <laughs> like, they were really playing, but that was okay. I 
I think all on the court dissolved the line between art and patron. There was a sense of familiarity and validation. They engaged with the work like it belonged to them. This exhibit has traveled a few times, and no matter how many signs I put up that says, don't touch the basketball shoes, do you know what they do? <laughs> touch the shoes. But that also is okay. I didn't anticipate, well, I anticipated, rather, for people to have like maybe a few conversations and some context. If, if you've ever been to an art exhibition, there's pictures on the wall, people come in, sip some wine, and really the art is just something that exists around them. But I didn't expect people to have real feelings in real time. This woman approached me with tears in her eyes. She was also a stranger, and she told me, I thought they were just playing basketball. I didn't know all this other stuff was going on. And I think what she meant by that was, I thought basketball was just something black boys did. I didn't know the basketball court was a place that they go to feel their feelings, to feel love, pride, anger, loss, or affection. The basketball court isn't just a place. It's a sanctuary. Thank you.